So I'm going to talk uh, more today about the value side. You've heard a lot of people talk about values, but what are those values that we're trying to protect and how are we trying to protect them? And we'll start uh, right at the basics, if I can work this thing. Everybody else worked it? There. Okay. So when we first learn about fire, we talk about the fire triangle, and we've heard all about climate change, doom and gloom, more higher severity fires, more difficult fires to control. But there is something we can do about it. First of all, we have uh, probably one of the best suppression organizations in the world, and one of the reasons you heard that we're in the problem we, we're in is because we've done so well at putting out fires. But the reverse part of that equation is we can start removing fuel. Removing fuel means this triangle won't support a fire. And so really we're not helpless. Really in this uh, doom and gloom that the media portrays around fire, there are things that we can do. Uh, it's just a question of how do we get them done and what's the best way to do them. And I hope to talk to you about some of those things tonight. So first of all, I think we have to be more strategic in how we assess our landscape. You saw Lyle talking about uh, threat across the province, but really what we're talking about in any kind of risk management framework is probability and consequence or impact. And we need to frame where the probability of fire is high and where the consequence is also high and address those within our planning frameworks to mitigate the risk. So obviously if you have a high probability, high consequence situation, you want to be very proactive and, and probably invest significant dollars to address that concern. Whereas if we were talking about in the Alpine, where you get the benefits that Jed was talking about, you, you, you wouldn't do anything, you'd do nothing, you'd let the fire burn. So we have to prioritize across our landscape how we do things, and we have to put our values of, uh, at risk within this framework to prop properly move forward in terms of expenditures, our efforts, our planning, and making uh, decisions about modified response. Allowing a fire to burn in a given landscape is a difficult question without understanding what your values at risk are. So what are some of the values that we have at risk? I mean, you saw a wind farm already tonight. I'm going to show you a SAG-D plant in Alberta. SAG-D is an oil extraction uh, plant that injects steam into the ground, and they liquefy the oil and bring it up to the surface. That plant you see in the top corner there is worth a billion dollars, one billion dollars. Um, and there's a cluster of probably 10 of them within 100 square kilometers of that picture. So there's $10 billion, and if you kind of get a general look at the landscape, it's probably one of the highest hazard fuel types in Alberta. Numerous plants in the last couple of years have been evacuated during fires, have had uh, infrastructure damaged, and have been at the mercy of fire to the effect where the oil industry at one point uh, last year in the Richardson fire was saying that the GDP of Canada could be affected. The second picture, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but that's the community of Whistler. Billions of dollars of real estate development nestled in the forest. Great place to visit. I love going there. I like skiing there. But in a fire season, it's a concern. A watershed. People depend on water, surface water, to drink. We in Vancouver and in Victoria depend on water from a source like this. If that landscape burns and we have uh, an erosion event or we have a debris flow that moves into the water system, it would be catastrophic to our water system. And finally, maybe not as important a value to everybody and it doesn't really show up, but there's a little owl poking out of that snag. And there's a lot of habitat, a lot of critters that are rare and endangered on the landscape, and we also have to take note of those as, re as it relates to fire. Here's that model home in Whistler, uh, probably worth about $2.5 million. Lyle talked about FireSmart. This isn't FireSmart. This is built entirely of wood. It has wood roofing, and the picture beside it is an ember shower that would happen in a typical interface fire. You can only imagine thousands of embers hitting that wood structure with the vegetation around that, uh, that building. It doesn't have a chance. And if you go through British Columbia, we continue to build more and more homes like this. And Lyle talked about it's a shared responsibility. 
we're not going to solve this problem until we stop building these kind of examples in fire vulnerable communities. How do we do that? What's the step to do that? Well, in community wildfire protection planning, we focus on a number of different phases. Key one is structure protection. How do we make those structures resilient from fire? We look at vegetation management. We've heard a number of people talk about fuel management. I'll talk about fuel management as well. Uh, emergency response. Before 2003, our fire service in British Columbia, that's the municipal fire service, uh, was not very knowledgeable about fi fighting wildland fires. And over the past 15 years, there's been tremendous integration of traditional structure firefighters with wildland firefighters. There's more tools available to structural, structural uh, firefighters, sprinkler kits, uh, different uh, deployment trucks, all kinds of infrastructure that's made us better at responding to interface fires. And then finally, I think we continue to struggle with the whole education and communication phase of things. We continue to see human-caused ignitions in the wrong place at the wrong time. Honestly, I don't believe regulation is going to solve that. I think it's continuing to hammer, but regardless, I think we're going to have irresponsible people doing silly things with fire. And the other thing I've learned in my career is there's a thousand ways to start a fire. Whether it's a Coke bottle in a grassland, a muffler on an ATV, or somebody scratching a rock with a, a piece of heavy equipment, you can start a fire under, any condi under dry conditions in, in numerous ways, and we're always going to have fire here. So I don't know how you can regulate fire ignitions. I don't think you can. So what we can regulate, though, is how we build and where we build. This is an example from the District of North Van. The District of North Van has what's called a development permit area. And in that development permit area, if you build a new house, new structure, you are required to meet a fire smart standard. You can see in this Google Earth image the old house with the purple footprint, which is the new mega house that's going to replace that existing house. You can see a pinkish line around that house. That's a 10 meter vegetation free zone. All the little green dots are trees around that house. The objective is to minimize the vegetation in that 10 meter priority one fire free zone and build the house with structural attributes that are not vulnerable to fire. So in other words, they must have a rated roof, they must build with hardy boards, stucco, all kinds of building materials that are non-fire flammable. And they're landscaping, they're not allowed to put any cedar, juniper, or any fire uh, flammable type of material within the building envelope. Very successful, we've built, we've seen about probably 250 homes built in this zone of 3,500 homes over the last two years that would meet the standard that would make them fire smart in the event of a wildfire. Again, an example in Whistler. On your left, the fuel before we started thinning. On your right, the fuel after we, started, after we finished thinning. Goal, keep the fire on the ground. Don't let it go in the crown. Again, Lyle pointed out to it, we can put a retardant drop in there, we can safely put firefighters in there, and we can stop a fire in a stand with these attributes. Unfortunately, around British Columbia, we have too much of the fuel on the left-hand side. So I'll go back to, it's the fuel, stupid, that's what we got to deal with, okay? This is the Coquitlam ozonation plant. In the middle of a forest, uh, coastal forest, Low, prop, low to moderate probability fire. You can also see there's a lot of dead trees in there. Those are hemlock looper uh, killed trees that Lori many years ago studied with me. And this plant is worth about $300 million. It's an ozonation plant. We call it critical infrastructure. If there was a fire around this plant, it's serviced with a wood pole line for electricity. In other words, when I first looked at it, they, they had no backup generation here. They had vents into all their computer and control systems. If there was a fire here, likely this would have had to close. During the fire, they couldn't have safely kept people in there. Our water system was servicing 300,000 people at the time I evaluated this in August of about 2007. Those people would have had no water in a significant fire event. Similar kinds of infrastructure exist all across British Columbia, whether it's electrical, whether it's sanitation, whether it's water delivery, all of these 
plants have some vulnerability to fire and we need to find out how to protect them, how to make them more resilient in a fire situation. So we've talked about the community, we've talked about protecting homes. Lyle talked about our other goal is to move outside of the community and start looking at the resource values beyond that urban interface. So this is a fire uh, that was planned in Mount Robson Provincial Park in 2005. We burned 4,000 hectares with multiple goals. First goal was to stop a landscape level fire from taking out Jasper. Second was to build some habitat to hold wildlife on that side of the highway so they weren't roadkill in the middle of the winter because this was very low in biodiversity, elk, uh, goats, uh, caribou all liked to cross the highway to get to better habitat during the winter and they were very vulnerable to, to highway traffic. This burn, I just was there two weeks ago, is amazing in terms of its structure and biodiversity today and uh, some really neat features to it. We used to burn, when I started in forestry in British Columbia, between 300 and 400,000 hectares per year. Our provincial average for the last five years is probably less than 10,000 hectares. Why? Because burning is risky and the physician community has been very proactive in reducing prescribed burning for the purpose of controlling emissions and reducing health caused problems in terms of respiratory and asthma disease. If you look like at a summer like we had this year, I would say the impacts of the fire season probably had more health concerns than small controlled burns that we could undertake um, with the right people. We need to do more prescribed burning and I think to a large extent we have to work on policy to get fire back on the landscape. We need, it's, it's the cheapest tool we have. When I uh, showed you that slide of Whistler and the fuel treatments, fuel treatments are ranging from anywhere from a, a low of around 3,000 hectares, $3,000 a hectare, to up to $30,000 a hectare when you have to take that fuel off site and you can't burn it. We need that fire tool to be able to remove that fuel. Lyle talked about we've got to get broader on the landscape. This is a, a Google Earth image of Cranbrook. Cranbrook probably next to Kelowna is one of the most vulnerable communities to a landscape level fire that I'm aware of in BC. And we need to start working with existing fuel breaks and you can see there's a transmission line in there inside that red line and we need to create that footprint of fuel treatment across the landscape at, broader, at a broader scale to protect our timber values and other values at risk that are out broadly from the community. It's not just the communities that, that we need to focus. We need to get beyond the communities and the Doki Wind Farm was a good example. We have a lot of value, billions of dollars of values outside a community, cell towers, things that you wouldn't even believe, uh, integrated power projects. We've invested millions of dollars putting those facilities in place and we need to protect them. So we need a network of breaks across the landscape where we can stop fire strategically. Again, I use the word strategically. We can't afford to put these everywhere. We, can't, we, can't, we have to put them in the right places. We have to make the right decisions up front. Don't want you to get confused about the, the numbers, but Lori's talked to you about the fuel from the effects of fire suppression. We also have a mountain pine beetle fuel problem, but the scale of this problem is massive. In 2004, I did an analysis for the province and we demonstrated there are about 600,000 hectares of high risk fuels near to communities, over a million hectares outside of communities. We've been building, we've been continuing to build the interface. We've been continuing to put infrastructure on the landscape and we've also had a mountain pine beetle epidemic. So these numbers are not even in the, in the game anymore. They're way worse. Uh, there's publications in the US that say we've only really developed about 15% of the potential interface. In BC, I think we probably only developed about 5% of the potential interface. So this problem is gonna continue to grow, uh, probably substantially over the next 20 to 25 years, and we're concerned about this changing fire regime. So I think 
what we need to do is we've allocated funds and resources to start ourselves on a path to deliver on protection at the community level. We need to continue that momentum, and we need more momentum at the landscape level to focus on these same issues of uh, values at risk. This is the Tolkal Mill from the Barrier Fire in 2003. This was a, about a $40 million facility that burned down. The Tolkal collected on insurance and never built the mill again. So you can imagine the economic impacts of some of these fires on some of these communities. So it's not, the other thing we focus on is we want to stop fire, we want to suppress fire, and you heard that we were spending hundreds of millions of dollars on suppression this summer. But you're not, we're not talking about the economic losses after the fire. And research in the US has shown that the multiplier for every dollar we spend on suppression, we spend 24 to $29 on post-fire losses. So that's another thing a lot of people don't think about. It's not just the cost of the fire at the time of the fire. It's the tourism that didn't come because of smoke, the losses to the resort, whatever. There's a whole host of economic and social value loss post-fire. And I'll close with my soapbox here. In British Columbia, we've been focused on managing the forest resource strictly from, for the purposes of jobs and revenue. And we have a framework of forest management in BC that really, there's three legs to, three legs to the stool. There's tenure, who has rights to the trees, stumpage the tax revenue that's generated and what you pay, and finally, a regulatory framework. I subscribe to the belief that I don't think we can solve this fire problem until we rework the system. The current system does not consider fire adequately. We are moving ahead, but if we're going to be really successful, I really believe the forest management framework in British Columbia has to change. And I'll close on that note, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.